This morning we find our text from the Gospel according to John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. John 21, 1 through 14. There we read God's word. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. And Simon Peter, and Thomas, also known as Didymus, and Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, and Simon Peter told him. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon and Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples uh, followed in the boat, towing in a net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning. Uh, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many fish, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So far, reading from God's holy word. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters of our Lord in Jesus Christ, after the Lord Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, we know that he appeared to his disciples and his followers on a number of occasions there in the city of Jerusalem. But now in our text this morning, we see the disciples are in Galilee. And Galilee is up in the northern part of, of Israel. And the reason that they were up there in Galilee is that the Lord Jesus had told the women in Jerusalem on Easter Sunday that they should go and tell the disciples that, to go to Galilee and that he would meet them there. And as they are now waiting for the Lord Jesus uh, to appear in Galilee, uh, Simon and Peter says uh, to the other disciples who are with him, I'm going to go fishing. And so when the Lord Jesus does appear, he finds his disciples out on the lake in the boat, and they're fishing. John also tells us in the story how the Lord Jesus helped his disciples in order that they might catch a large catch of fish in their net. Now, it's an interesting story. But as with all the interesting stories that we find in the Gospels, there's always a, a purpose, a, a meaning behind these stories and these events. And so it indeed, is, it's, it's a real story. The disciples really did go fishing. They really did catch a huge number uh, of fish. And yet when the Lord Jesus does these kinds of things, and when we read about these kinds of stories, there is always something that the Lord Jesus is trying to teach us. There's always a deeper meaning behind these kinds of actions. This story really, you can say, becomes a metaphor, or you might say an illustration of the work that the Lord Jesus is going to give his disciples to do in the future. So in order to understand this as an illustration, we need to go back to something that the Lord Jesus uh, taught in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. Uh, there the Lord Jesus compares the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, to a net. 
to a net that is let down into the water. And when they pull the net up, it brings up with it all kinds of different fish. Now, in that particular story, uh, the Lord Jesus is teaching about separating the good fish from the bad fish. But it's already clear that the Lord Jesus uses this connection, this analogy between the net that is let down into the water with the gathering of, with the gathering of fish into the kingdom of God. And so when the f- disciples now go fishing in the lake of Galilee, the Lord uses this situation to give an illustration that he is about to send his disciples into the world that they might gather in the fish, the fish representing here the people that God is going to bring into uh, the kingdom of heaven. And so the Lord Jesus is preparing the disciples for the great work that he is going to call them to do in this world. It becomes clear that they will be sent out by the Lord Jesus to go and gather into the kingdom God's people from all over the earth. And we know that this work that the Lord Jesus gives to his disciples didn't end when all the disciples uh, uh, passed away and, and, and died. No, this calling continues to be the calling that the Lord Jesus gives uh, to the church And so also today, as the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have this this task uh, to go on and to gather people from uh, out of the whole world into the church and into the kingdom of God. And we may be sure that that work will never fail because the Lord will assure that there will indeed be a great harvest. And so this morning, we will listen to God's word under uh, this theme, the disciples of Jesus go fishing. The disciples of Jesus go fishing. Under that theme, we'll look at three things. First of all, we'll look at the catch. And secondly, we'll look at the great fisherman who is revealed in this catch. And thirdly, we see that Jesus gives provision for his disciples. John John tells us that not uh, all 12 of the disciples were present. In fact, there's only 11 at this time. Remember, Judas had, had left them. There are just seven disciples here. We're told that there was Peter, Simon Peter. There's Thomas, who's called Didymus, or one of the twin, or he's called the twin. Uh, and there's Nathaniel, who is from Cana uh, in Galilee. And then there's James, and there is John, who are, are the sons of, of Zebedee. And then there are two others, two other disciples, who are not named. And when Peter says, I'm going to go fishing, the other disciples um, said, Peter, we're going to go along with you. And so they all climbed together into the boat, and they fished throughout the entire night, but they did not catch anything. Now, we read together, there was also from Luke chapter 5, where we read about another occasion where Jesus went fishing with the disciples. And when Jesus said to the disciples at that time that let's go out, it was the daytime, let's go out into uh, the deeper water and put in your net and catch some fish. And Peter says to, to Jesus at, to, at that time, he says, uh, Jesus, you know, we've worked hard all night long and we haven't caught anything at all. And so it seems to be indeed that was the practice that they would often go fishing at nighttime. And it must have happened more often uh, that they might have a bad night. There may be nights where there's just no fish to be caught. And so when the morning finally came here in our story in John 21, uh, the Lord Jesus was standing on the shore of the sea or of the lake, and, and he called out to them, and he asked them, he says, friends, haven't you any fish? Well, that word friends literally is the word children. And Jesus uses the word children here as a term of endearment. Now, in in the English language, we would never uh, call adult people uh, children. We do know that that in other languages, uh, there are such words that convey um, uh, uh, that endearment for somebody uh, that would convey the aspect of, you know, a child or, or you being my children. Jesus asks this question as if he already knew that the answer was that it was no. And so indeed, the disciples, they respond back and they say to the man on the shore, he says, no. And then John also adds this point. He says, and as the disciples, we didn't realize 
that it was the Lord Jesus who was standing there on the shore. And so this man on the shore, who's Jesus, says, says to them, he says, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some fish. And when they did that, then John says they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Well, just think about this. Remember that some of these disciples, such as Peter and James and John, uh, they were experienced fishermen. They knew how to fish. They knew where they sh could find the fish also here on this lake. And so that many uh, ask today, says, well, why would these disciples, why would they listen to a stranger who is standing there on the shore? And we don't know. We don't know uh, what the disciples were necessarily thinking at this time. It, it seems that the Lord Jesus has spoken away that they simply thought that they should listen uh, to what this man had to say uh, to them. The more important question here is this. What is the meaning? What's the meaning behind this particular miracle? And the first thing that becomes clear from the story uh, is that the Lord Jesus is the one who is in control even of the fish who are living here in the lake. Jesus knows that the fish are there on the right side of the boat. And we can even say that it is the Lord Jesus who is driving the fish into the net. And so we need to keep in mind that this is not the first time that Jesus shows that he has mastery even over the fish who are in the water. Remember Luke chapter 5. Jesus is the one who told the disciples, let's go out into the deeper water and, and put your net in the water that we might catch some fish. And then uh, Peter says to the Lord Jesus at that time, he says, but Lord, we've been fishing all night long, right? It's no use. They knew the lake. They knew what the habits of the fish were. And so the P Peter then also objects and says, Lord, it's useless. But yet Peter says, but because you say so. And so they then also recognize Jesus' authority. He says, I will do it. And when he put the net out, the net was so full of fish that the net began to break. And so when you read these stories, but what the Lord Jesus is doing, Jesus is doing more than just showing us that he has the ability to be able to help the disciples catch uh, fish so that their nets are always full. After they catch that net, that is full of fish in Luke chapter 5, the Lord Jesus goes on and he says to them, from now on, as my disciples, you will be fishers of men. So the question now we have is, so what's John's purpose in telling us this new story here in John 21? Well, first of all, we need to notice that John, in the previous chapter, he ends chapter 21 in a way as if he has finished telling the story about the life of the Lord in Jesus. And after he's finished telling the story about the life of the Lord Jesus, uh, then he seems to add a couple of extra stories in this extra chapter. Remember that John says at the very end of chapter 7, he says, I wrote this gospel about the life of the Lord Jesus so that you may believe, and by believing, you may have eternal life. So why, if it seems like he has now finished telling the story about Jesus, why does John add this extra chapter. Did John, maybe after he finished writing, think, oh, wait a minute, I, I forgot a couple of important stories. Well, that's not how the Gospels and the Bible are, are written. What John is, is doing in this chapter is he's telling us about the next phase in, in the life of his disciples. Here in these stories, Jesus is focusing on their future. And he's teaching his disciples about their future work in the kingdom of God. And so when the disciples go out fishing this time, it's going to illustrate the work that the Lord Jesus has for them in the future. They are to go and they are to cast the net of the gospel into the world and they are to haul in many men and women into the kingdom of God. And so we 
understand that, then there's also a couple of, or a few elements in this story that we need to pay some close attention to. The first thing that we, we read is that the disciples, that they were working hard uh, through the whole night. And when the morning finally came, uh, they had caught not a single fish. In other words, their work had been fruitless. And it is only when the Lord Jesus finally came to them and he directed them in their work that they were able to catch any fish. And so remember what I said. These, some of these men, they were experienced fishermen. They knew how to fish. They knew where to fish in the lake. And yet, without the help of the Lord Jesus, they were not able to catch a single fish. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that this story or this event takes place sometime between the resurrection of the Lord Jesus on Easter Sunday and the day of Pentecost that comes 50 days later when the Holy Spirit is poured out uh, on the disciples and on the early church. Remember the Lord Jesus had also told his disciples that they should not yet go out, they should not yet go out of Jerusalem to, to spread and to preach the gospel. They shouldn't do that until they should receive the Holy Spirit. That would happen on the day of Pentecost. Why? Because without the assistance of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the preaching of the gospel message would be fruitless and useless. The disciples, they can work as hard as they want. They can be as, put as many hours in as they would like. Uh, but the point is that they will never produce anything for the kingdom of God. And that is wonderfully also re revealed to us on the day of Pentecost. Right? That's the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church in Jerusalem and on the disciples. And Peter stood up and the disciples as well. And they began to proclaim the gospel message about the risen Lord. And remember what happened. On that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. There on the day of Pentecost, the Lord Jesus gave a huge harvest. One that the disciples at this particular time could not even begin to imagine happening. And then from then on, we read in the book of Acts that the Lord kept adding to the number of the church day by day. What this also reveals today, beloved, is that as a church of our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot bring in the harvest of God's people without the work of Jesus Christ and without the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to keep in mind that we do not grow the church. It is Christ who grows his church. And without the blessing of the Lord and without the blessing of his spirit, all our work in proclaiming the gospel will be done in vain. And so we need to keep in mind here an important principle when we're also busy calling people into the kingdom of God, calling people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is this, that the gathering of Christ's church always remains a miracle. And it's not our doing, but it is the very work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet there are, are many today, also many Christians, who, who think that the church needs to change change the message of the gospel in order that we might be relevant you know, to the world and the, and the society and the culture in which we're living. There are those who argue that the gospel needs to, refle needs to reflect the values of our modern world in order that people might listen to the gospel. And then you may ask yourselves, you may wonder, why do so many people think that we need to change the gospel message from what we receive in the Bible. And I would suggest that part of the reason is that in our modern, in our modern culture, uh, people think that success is determined by using the right tactics and having the right message uh, for the right audience. Right, today we are conditioned to think that we determine success by what we do. And if what we're doing doesn't work, then we need to change the way that we are indeed doing things. Now, as with many wrong ideas, there are also kernels of truth in them. 
And so there's also some truth in that particular thought. Because it means, beloved, that when we as church witness the gospel to people in this modern world, we also need to keep in mind that today's world is indeed different from the world a thousand years ago, or even two thousand years ago, when the apostles were proclaiming the gospel. That means that the questions and the issues that people have today and that people are, are dealing with today is quite different or can be quite different. They're not all different. There are many issues that we would say nothing's really changed, but there are also other things that have changed. And therefore, when, when we bring the gospel to, to the people also in our culture, in our society today, we are not to change the gospel message itself, but we are to direct that gospel message to the questions and to the issues that people are dealing with in the culture in which we are living. And therefore, you can say this. You can say that, that the gospel message never changes. But what changes is the way people in this world view the issues of life. And that means that as church, that we are also called to do the hard work of addressing those issues from a biblical point of view. And we may sometimes also need to deal with those issues in ways that may not always be popular uh, to people's way of thinking. And so you just think practically about the past. Our society today thinks differently about issues such as abortion, euthanasia, thinks differently about sexuality, even thinks differently about family, where people are thinking about families is about patriarchy and therefore we need to get rid of the family structures. And so these are issues that people in our society today think about differently than people even did 50 years ago. And so the question here is, does that mean that the gospel message needs to accommodate these new values that we are confronting in our society? Or does the gospel message address these issues by revealing that in Christ Jesus there is a better way that the Lord Jesus reveals to us the way of truth? You know, as Christians, we may sometimes feel shame for the gospel because uh, the gospel message can be radically different from the values that, you, that you're confronted with in society. And, and when you proclaim and you talk about your values, other people, they kind of go, what, are you old-fashioned? How can you believe that? Even though it is the very values that the Lord God himself has revealed to us are timeless. And the reality also is this, is that when the church becomes unfaithful in proclaiming the truths of the gospel, no matter how hard we might be working, we will be utter, utter failures. We also see that churches that have strayed from the truth in the end, they have lost themselves. And when we lose ourselves, and over time, such churches will also disappear. And you may wonder, well, why? Why would they disappear? Why is it that they cannot re continue on even though they're parenting, parenting the, the, the values of culture all around them? Well, simply because of this. It's because they have separated themselves from the Lord Jesus Christ. They have struck out on their own path. And without Christ, we will be utter failures in this world. But we may also be assured, beloved, that when we remain faithful in bringing the message of the gospel, when we seek the Lord Jesus Christ and we seek the help of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord will then also continue to, to drive people into the great net of his kingdom. When we remain faithful, then Christ will also equip us for that work. And he will also cause that gospel to be fruitful in the world in which we are listening or in which we are living. When the disciples here in the story, when they submit to Christ's words by putting the net on, into the sea on the right side of the boat, it means they have to go against every human thought that they have, every human idea about what's the right thing to do in, in fishing here. No, they, they, put the, they, they listen to the Lord Jesus, they submit to his will, and what does the Lord do? He gives them a huge catch so that they counted 153 large fish. And the disciples, they could have said, no, this is crazy. You know, we know what we're doing. 
We're going to do it our way. Our way is better than your way to Jesus. But you know what the end of the story would have been. They would have failed miserably. They would not have caught a single fish. And so when the disciples, when they submitted to Christ's way, their net was full of fish against all human expectations. Now, we also need to, to see that there is a, a very important connection to what Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, way back in the Old Testament, uh, saw in a, in a vision in chapter 47. Ezekiel, in chapter 47, saw a vision from God, a vision of a river that was flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem, and it was flowing down uh, to, into, the, into the Dead Sea. Right? The Dead Sea is the Salt Sea. Nothing could live. And he sees that where the fresh water going, flowing from the temple meets the, the salt water of the Dead Sea, the water becomes fresh. And there Ezekiel sees many fish, and he sees fishermen on the shore that are catching fish at will. And the point of the vision is this. The point is that one day, God wants to reveal that one day, fresh water will flow from the temple into the brackish water of the world. And so here in John chapter 21, the Lord Jesus reveals that after his resurrection, that day that, I, that Ezekiel saw in that vision has now finally come. Jesus is going to send his disciples into the world, and there they will present the world with the gospel. And that gospel, it will be like fresh water that flows into a world that just cannot flourish because, of, this, because of, the dis, of the destroying effect of sin and evil and corruption in the world. The gospel will flow into the world and that will again restore life to people who are living in their sins, in their wickedness, and who are living without any hope. Christ will again gather into the net of his kingdom a great catch of people. In fact, the disciples count the number of fish. It was 150 Three. If you look at the commentaries, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of speculation about that number, 153. Many wonder whether there is maybe some symbolical meaning behind this particular number. The problem is that the Bible doesn't give an answer to that question. You can't find anywhere in Scripture's uh, satisfactory answer to what might be the symbolic uh, meaning behind this particular uh, number. But that still leaves us with the question, so why does John tell us that they counted the number of fish and that John even tells us the number of fish that they counted? Why is this particular little point, this little detail? We know that in Scriptures, these details often have some value, have some meaning. And for me, the, the answer must be simply this, that the harvest of fish is being numbered by the Lord Jesus. It means, beloved, that there is nothing haphazard about the work of our Lord. He knows the number of those he is, whom he is harvesting into his kingdom. Not even one of his fish, not even one of his people will be lost. They will all be accounted for. So what an encouragement the Lord Jesus then also gives to his disciples. Here they are to go out. They are to be fishers of men, of people. Christ will give, them, will give to them a great harvest. And those whom he will gather are already numbered by the Lord. And so the harvest is sure. The nets will be full. And the number of God's people will be filled. Another aspect of this story is that the Lord Jesus reveals himself as the great fisherman in this story. The three times in this story, John says that Jesus revealed himself. I guess lost a little in our translation. When instead of using the word revealed, our translation uses the word appeared, and then only uses it twice. In verse 1, actually, the word revealed is, is used twice by John. It says that Jesus, not repeared, but Jesus revealed himself to his disciples. 
And then it says in our translation, and this is how it happened, but it really says, literally says, um, and this is how he revealed himself. And then the story also ends in verse 14. John writes, he says, this is the third time that Jesus revealed himself to his disciples. Now, there's some, some question as to whether Jesus did not reveal himself more often. Uh, and, of course, he did. And so we're not going to get into as to what, how, why John speaks about the third time. What's important here is how Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. Remember, when the disciples saw the, uh, Jesus standing on the shore. John says they did not recognize him. They did not even recognize his voice when he spoke to them from the shore. Remember the same thing happened earlier when, when Jesus met the two men who were on the way to Emmaus shortly after his resurrection. And also these two men, they did not recognize the Lord Jesus when he appeared to them. And so what we see then is after his resurrection, there are also times when the Lord Jesus hides his identity from his followers and from, the, from his disciples. So the question then is, so how did the disciples suddenly realize who this man is who is standing there on the shore? Verse 17, John, in verse 17, John says that the disciple whom Jesus loved, is simply a way of referring to himself, because this is John. They said to Peter, it's the Lord. It is the Lord. Well, did John come to this conclusion because maybe he had better eyesight than Peter did so he could better see who that man was who was standing on the shore? And the answer is no. It was not his eyes that caused him to be able to see who this man was. What caused Peter to, to see who this man was was the miracle the miracle of this great catch of fish. For keep in mind, this is not the first time that this has happened. Back in Luke chapter 5, Jesus then also gave his disciples that huge catch of fish. And then afterwards he said to, to them, uh, this is an illustration that I will make you fishers of men. So what happens here is John recognizes the Lord Jesus, not just because of his physical eyes, but he can see him, but because of the work that the Lord Jesus is doing. What happened here by this great catch of fish cannot be explained to John and to the other disciples in any other way than this must be the work of the Lord Jesus. It means, beloved, if Jesus died on the cross, it, he has to have risen from the dead. He must have risen from the dead in order that this miracle might happen, right? If Jesus died on the cross, he was still dead. It means that this would not have been possible. But the fact that it happens is a clear indication to John, to the disciples, the Lord Jesus is living. And so Jesus is known by John through his work. And then we're told that Simon Peter, hearing this, immediately he puts his clothes back on and he jumps into the water in order that he might go to his Lord. There's a lesson also for us today, beloved. It's this. It's not that here we have proof that Jesus is really raised from the dead. That's not really, I believe, the most important lesson of the story. Yes, the story gives us an eyewitness account from the disciples that the Lord Jesus really did rise up from the dead. So that's wonderful. But it reveals much more. It reveals that the Lord Jesus, it reveals, beloved, the Lord Jesus reveals himself also today. And how does the Lord Jesus reveal himself today? As he did to his disciples, he reveals himself today to us through his work. And so, yes, we have this wonderful eyewitness account of the disciples. But, beloved, the evidence of Christ's work is also available to us today. Because even more miraculous than the catch of fish is the work of the Lord Jesus today in our own hearts, in our own lives, and his work of calling people out of this world into his kingdom. It means, beloved, that today we have the evidence of Christ's work within us. We see the evidence of Christ's work in the lives of our brothers and our sisters who love their Lord. 
We have the evidence of Christ's work also in the lives of those whom Christ brings out of the world and brings to himself. Remember that mission work, it's not our work. It is Christ's work. How do you explain all those stories of these men and women who come to the Lord and whom the Lord has brought to faith through the gospel message also today? When you listen to some of the stories of how the Lord has brought people to the faith, you understand that the Lord Jesus was at work in their lives. There's no other way to be able to understand it. How do you explain the desire in, in the hearts of those who did not serve the Lord before and who now have come to see the Lord and who now love their Lord? How do you even explain the desire there in your own heart in which you hate the sin and the evil that you still see in your life? And how do you explain also then the change that takes place in your life so that you now desire and you want to serve the Lord your God? Then we can only say the Lord reveals himself to us also in these things. And therefore I know that my Lord Jesus is indeed the Lord of all the earth. He is also my Lord. And then at the end of the story, Jesus invites his disciples to come and have breakfast. And he took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. There are some who suggest that the Lord Jesus may be celebrating the Lord's Supper here with his disciples. It's probably saying more than what the text tells us, for the text says that he gave them bread and fish. There's no mention of the wine that normally would accompany such a celebration. On the other hand, the language here does convey the idea that the Lord Jesus, as their Lord, it gives them the food that they need in their lives. Remember that the disciples have been busy all night. They've been working hard. Remember, Peter even had taken his clothes off because he's probably hot and the clothes probably got in the way of being able to, to do his work as a fisherman. And in the morning, they would have been exhausted and they would have been hungry that morning. And the Lord Jesus, he understands that they need food for their own sustenance at this time. And so again here, what do you see? You see that the Lord Jesus, you see what kind of a Lord, what kind of a Savior the Lord Jesus really is. Jesus is thinking, not about himself. You know, he's thinking about his disciples. He's thinking about their needs that morning. He sees what they need, and in loving care, what does he do? He goes and he gets breakfast ready so that when they come to the shore, they can eat. Right? The Lord Jesus thinks about their physical needs here at this time. Will the Lord not also think about their spiritual needs when they begin to proclaim the gospel to the world? You know, in that sense, you can make then a connection to the Lord's Supper. Because there in the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus reminds us in the bread and the wine that he will nourish our hungry and thirsty souls uh, to everlasting life. Right? Jesus promises that he will spiritually sustain his disciples when they are busy with his work catching people for the kingdom of God. And today we have this ongoing assurance, beloved, that our Lord will also nourish us spiritually uh, for the work in his kingdom. That means as God's people, we do not stand alone here in this world. No, we have a Lord who, who watches over us, who sees what, what, what we're doing. He sees all of your needs. And therefore, you can also go to him and expect that he will give to you the spiritual strength that is necessary for the work he gives to you to do in his kingdom. And therefore, as the church and as the children, and Jesus, remember, he addressed the disciples as children. And so as children of God, beloved, we are called to be fishermen in the kingdom of our Lord. And as we are busy with that kingdom work, the Lord will indeed also sustain us for that work. And we may be absolutely sure that he will also grant you his blessing. Amen.